Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 885 for August 2nd, 2021. Coming up in a few minutes. If you're around Lynchburg, Tennessee, you'll learn pretty quickly everybody has a nickname. So it's not surprising that he had a nickname. We're awfully glad that someone thought to name him, nickname him Jack, because I don't think we'd sell as much Jasper Newton. I spent a couple of days this past week visiting the Jack Daniel Distillery in Lynchburg, Tennessee. While Jack Daniels is the most well-known and biggest-selling American whiskey worldwide, there are a lot of mysteries about Jack Daniel himself. It's also one of the few U.S. distilleries with a full-time historian. It's fair to say if Nelson Eddy doesn't have a good answer to a question about Jack Daniels, no one does. That includes one of the most often asked questions, where did the old number seven saying come from? Lots of theories, but nothing definitive. Nelson and I sat down for a chat to clear up some of the mysteries and misconceptions about the history of Jack Daniels. Our conversation is coming up later on Whiskey Cast in Depth. I'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, and on Behind the Label. Charcoal mellowing does not prevent us from identifying as bourbon whiskey. We could if we chose. Yeah, we'll answer that question once and for all, too. And announce our latest Whiskey Club of the Month. The news is next on this week's Whiskey Cast. What do Japan and Scotland have in common? You guessed it, whiskey. That's why Dewar's brought these two cultures together in our newest cast series innovation. Introducing Dewar's eight-year Japanese smooth. We took the Dewar's you know and love and finished it in rare Mizunara oak casks for a complex and balanced scotch whiskey like no other. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Robin Redbreast? You may have seen me around. Face label, label face. Yeah, that's the one. I'm now contractually obligated to be their spokesbird. <laughs> yeah, my agent didn't read the small print. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Let's get started with the news, and we'll begin with new distilleries in the works including what will be the first whiskey distillery in Manhattan since Prohibition. Proximo Spirits founder Juan Domingo Beckman of Mexico's Beckley plans to open his Great Jones Distilling Company on Broadway in Lower Manhattan later this month. Unlike most new distilleries, Great Jones will open with its own mature whiskey. Proximo quietly bought Black Dirt Distilling upstate in 2018, and has been making the Great Jones whiskey there during planning and construction in Manhattan. The whiskey from the new distillery will be matured in Black Dirt's warehouses. A hat tip to Robert Simonson for breaking this story in the New York Times on Thursday. Elsewhere, Uncle Nearest has expanded its footprint in Shelbyville, Tennessee, Founder Fawn Weaver and her team have acquired 53 acres of land next to the existing distillery site. They plan to use it for growing organic, non-GMO corn to use in its whiskies. In Indianapolis, West Fork Distilling plans to become one of the largest craft distillers in the U.S. It'll be expanding its operations from its downtown location to a new $10 million distillery north of the city in Westfield. Groundbreaking for the new distillery took place this past week with plans to open next spring. It'll include a restaurant, speakeasy, and events center, along with expanded distilling and maturation capacity. In Scotland, Murray Council has now approved plans for the Dunfail Distillery project from the owners of London's Bimber Distillery, Construction is expected to begin early next year to convert a farmsteading into a distillery capable of producing 200,000 liters of spirit each year. The distillery will also have its own floor maltings. Dunfail's owners are still working out all of the financing details for the project. 
And Diageo has now announced that its new Johnny Walker experience in downtown Edinburgh will open on September 6th. Tickets officially went on sale today for tours at Prince's Street. The tours start at £25 each, including a 90-minute tour and three personalized Scotch whiskey drinks. We'll have more details as they become available on this one. In Japan, Kurosawa Distillers has broken ground on its new Kamaro Distillery. The new distillery is only seven miles away from the original Kurosawa site. It is scheduled to begin distilling in early 2023. In other news, rising COVID cases are prompting fears of yet another wave of the pandemic. Don't be surprised to see distilleries requiring all visitors to start wearing masks again, even if local and state governments are not mandating them. While I was at the Jack Daniel Distillery in Lynchburg this past week, General Manager Larry Combs told us they'll be requiring all guests to wear masks starting this week. That follows a recent COVID case on the distillery team. If you're planning a distillery visit anywhere, it's always best to check ahead of time for the latest updates on mask requirements and tour limitations. We are also starting to see more whiskey events being postponed because of the pandemic. Whiskey Live in Perth had been scheduled for the weekend of August 20th and 21st, but with more lockdowns in Australia, that has now been postponed until the last weekend of November. In Sweden, the Malmo Beer and Whiskey Festival has now been postponed from September until next March. Organizers posted on the festival's website that current restrictions on public events may not be lifted in enough time to make the event possible in September. And in the Netherlands, Maltstock, September 10th through the 12th, is still on for now, but the organizers sent word this past week that the Dutch government's restrictions on festivals have now been extended until at least September 1st. Of course, another extension would put that event in jeopardy. As I mentioned last week, Maltstock will require all attendees to show proof of either vaccination or a recent negative COVID test. Looking now at new whiskeys, Suntory is reviving the classic Yamazaki 25-year-old single malt with a new blend created by chief blender Shinji Fukuyo of whiskeys matured in American oak, Spanish oak, and Japanese Mizunara oak. It'll carry a recommended retail price in the U.S. of $2,000 a bottle. Dublin's Teeling Whiskey Company is out with the third release in its Wonders of Wood series. It's a single pot still whiskey distilled at Teeling and matured in Brandy PX Chestnut Casks. Only 600 bottles will be available through the Teeling Distillery shop and website at €100 Euros each. And finally, the Cory Vrecken Whirlpool off the coast of the Isle of Jura has been known for its danger to sailors for centuries. In fact, the Royal Navy officially considers the Cory Vrecken as unnavigable. Sunday, the Ravenhall brothers and five colleagues swam successfully through the Cory Vrecken with bottles of whiskey strapped to their bodies. Nick Ravenhall is managing director at Hollywood Distillery in Edinburgh. Alex is an executive at Adam Brands. Now, why did they do this? Well, the whiskeys are part of a charity project to raise money for Sea Shepherd New Zealand. The Ravenhall brothers founded Whiskey and Waves to raise awareness of the problems New Zealand's coastal waters face. The New Zealand natives are planning to swim some of the UK's other challenging open waters later this year as well. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. Join us each Friday at 5 p.m. New York time for our weekly Happy Hour Live webcast. You can catch all the fun on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. Time now for the WhiskeyCast calendar of events. Westport Whiskey and Wine in Louisville, Kentucky has its next summer concert series this Friday night. 
Milam and Green Distillery in Blanco, Texas, hosts a benefit for the Austin nonprofit musicians group Home this Saturday. Also in Texas, the Black Bourbon Society's Open Door Tour wraps up in Dallas with events on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Catoctin Creek's monthly bottling workshop is on August 14th in Purcellville, Virginia. The Whiskey Education Foundation has a pairing dinner on the 19th in San Francisco. Bonhams has its next auction of rare whiskeys on the 20th in Hong Kong. Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore has its next Whiskey on the Waterfront event on the 21st. And the Bedfordshire Gin and Whiskey Festival is set for August 28th in Leighton Buzzard, England. Right now, we have 156 virtual and in-person events on the searchable calendar at WhiskeyCast.com. If you're responsible for organizing a whiskey event, just use the contact form at our website to let us know about it, and we'll be glad to add it to the list. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Small batch. How would you describe it? It's like... An Irishman's understanding of baseball. Extremely limited. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. Redbreast. Pass it on. WhiskeyCast In Depth is brought to you by Oban and the Classic Malts lineup. Jack Daniels is arguably the best-selling American whiskey, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And without the distillery... The town of Lynchburg, Tennessee, would be just another typical small town. It may be hard to believe, but when I visited the distillery this past week, along with several other whiskey writers, it was actually my first visit to Jack Daniels. And the myths about Jack Daniel himself and the whiskey he created hang in the air around Lynchburg like the humidity on a hot summer day. And believe me, it was hot and humid there this past week. There are some questions that can never be answered, since Jack Daniel took the answers to the grave with him when he died in 1911. But Nelson Eddy knows more than almost anyone else about the myths and the facts. He's the official historian for Jack Daniel's, And while a jazz trio played before dinner the other night on Barbecue Hill overlooking Lynchburg, we sat down to talk. I think the history of Jack Daniels is probably unique in all of American whiskey because uh, it's obviously named after the founder, but... In a lot of the other cases where we have distilleries named after the founders, we know a lot more about those founders than we do about Jack, right? Well, um, you know, I guess one of the unique things about the Jack Daniels distillery is it's over 150 years old and it's still operating. So, uh, you know, I don't don't know if I can can make a comparison between uh, Jack Daniels and other historic distilleries and how much we know about them. Um, I've always been surprised, not as many books. You'd think this iconic global brand uh, in 170 plus countries around the world, that there would be many, many books. And there's actually really just two books written about Jack. One is from the 1960s, it's called the Jack Daniels Legacy Book. And the other is called uh, Blood and Whiskey. I think that was about 2004 or in there. Um, I've always thought, you know, why isn't there a movie about Jack? Uh, Because he has a really interesting story, um, especially all that we know now about Nearest Green and all that. I I think it would be a fascinating story. So I'm surprised. Um, But I think, too, we're living in a time period where people are far more interested in the history of whiskey. Uh, American whiskeys have grown. Uh, Each of them have a story. And uh, so people are, are digging in and wanting to know more. I know that Fawn Weaver has said she would like to do a movie about Nearest Green, and you can't do that movie without telling the story of Jack Daniel, can you? Absolutely. I mean, uh, Jack and Nearest, um, 
are, you know, together, they advanced each other's career in some form or fashion, working together. Uh, we don't know, you know, Jack fell in love with whiskey and he, he learned at the hands of Nearest Green. Nearest had other influences on Jack, I'm convinced. Uh, Jack loved music and Nearest uh, was a fiddle player and would play at the local get-togethers and whatnot. So we think that may have influenced the young Jack who would his entire life be a great lover of music. He had an upstairs ballroom in his house. Um, he had a Steinway grand piano. So, you know, those two, some have even, uh, some of the old timers even said that the nearest got his nickname. His real name is Nathan Green. Nearest got his nickname because he was always the person nearest to Jack Daniel. Now, I don't know if that's true, but it's just a story that the old timers have told here in town. How did they meet? There has been a number of stories told about how Jack Daniel wound up working for the Reverend Dan Call. You've done some research into this. What do we know to be as close to the actual story as we can get, given the lack of written records? Yeah, I think both Fawn and I, Fawn Weaver and I, would agree that the legacy book is probably the most accurate um, account of their meeting. And in that, you know, Jack is, is living with a family friend, the Wagner family. He's left home at a very early age. Uh, we think probably his father remarried because he had 10 children after his, his wife died. And Jack was not a big fan of his stepmother. And so he leaves home at an early age, uh, right around 10 years old. He's at the Wagner family's home, and they're a neighbor. And uh, through the Wagner family, he meets Dan Call. And Dan Call's a young man. He's got a wife. He's got a new child. And he's also got a farm, a general store, and a still. So he's got more than he can handle. And so Jack is really invited to come to the Dan Call house, not to make whiskey, but to uh, help his wife out and, and to be, you know, extra hands. And, uh, but while there, he meets nearest uh, children, Eli and George Green, who are closer to Jack's age. And it's through them that he'll meet nearest and he'll gravitate to the still and um, Dan Call will ask Nearest to teach Jack everything he knows about whiskey making. So that's, that's how it's recounted in the legacy book. And the person, Ben Green, not a relationship uh, to the Green family. He's from Shelbyville. He was a, a local uh, newspaper writer. Uh, he would have interviewed some people in the day that he wrote that that could remember uh, Jack Daniels and, and tell, you know, firsthand accounts. And uh, so when it's not recorded and meetings like that, of course, you know, we all meet people and we don't necessarily make a record of it. Um, where things aren't recorded, you really have to go with those earliest, um, you know, accounts. It's about the best we can do. We know that Dan Call fought in the Civil War in the Confederate Army. What happened during that period, and how did Jack wind up owning the distillery after the Civil War? Well, Dan Call does go off to fight in the Civil War, and while he's gone, he leaves the still. Uh, in charge of the still would have been Jack and Nearest. They were working side by side. They had control of the still, and so that's what's happening during the Civil War is there working side by side, which would have been a difficult time. You know, that area of Middle Tennessee goes back and forth between the Union and the Confederates five or seven times. I mean, it's just back and forth. There's skirmishes. There's a major battle down the road in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. There's a big battle in Franklin and in um, uh, Spring Hill and then Nashville. So we have all these battles going on. So it had been a trick to making whiskey during that time because you have thousands and thousands of soldiers going after the grain for themselves to feed their animals. Just on and on it goes. So you kind of wonder what that was like. Well, after the Civil War, you really have a religious fervor that takes place 
Uh, you have a, a big revivals going on because we've had so many people die in the war. And when faced with our own mortality, you know, people often turn to religion. And that was the case after the Civil War. Um, in Dan Call, there would be a revival in town, uh, and, and Prohibition was a part of that ro- revival. And so Dan's wife, it appears, was already trying to get him out of the whiskey-making business, but his congregation was too. So between his wife and the congregation saying, look, and this is not an exact quote, but between them saying, look, you, you've got to give up one of your two spiritual pursuits, either give up preaching or you give up making whiskey, Dan thought uh, he would sell his still, and he does. He sells it to Jack Daniel. Keeping in mind that while we don't know Jack's official birth year, it's estimated around 1848, which would have made him in 1861, probably around 13 years old when the Civil War started. That explains why he didn't fight in the war himself. Well, a couple of things. Uh, Jack was a diminutive person. He only grows to be five foot two. He's called the boy distiller because he looks really, really young. So a 13 year old Jack, just if, you know, people who are conscripting other folks are riding through town, he doesn't look even 13. But no, he, d- he will not fight in the Civil War. He'll stay at the call property and make whiskey. After he buys the still, Nearest and his two sons come to work w- alongside him, essentially, right? Well, I don't know exactly at what point, um, well, Nearest, for sure, comes to work for Jack. He'll be the first, they would have called it back then, not a master distiller. They would have called him a head distiller. Uh, depending on how many people were working with him. Um, so immediately when, um, now, Nearest has been freed, um, emancipation has taken place, he will be hired by Jack Daniels, and he will be Jack's first master distiller in 1866 when the distillery is established. I don't know exactly what point his two sons, George and Eli, but it's not too long because... By 1884, we know for sure Jack purchases the Cave Spring property where we are today, and George and Eli move with him. So they are hired before that move, and then they make the move with Jack. And for some reason, I'm not sure what, uh, he's recorded in the census as being a farmer. Nearest will not go to the new property. He's content to farm. And uh, the younger men will come and work for Jack. And ever since nearest, we've always had a member of the Green family working at the Jack Daniels Distillery. 150 years later. 150 years later. Now, I will add, you know, the Motlows, various members of the Motlow family have been involved and still are involved. Uh, There's a handful of families that can stretch or we can go back and in that crew photo and in others fine members of that family today and you know that's really our greatest quality control yes we have a qc lab we test things we we use all the science available but really when you have a parent doing a job they know that they will leave for their child to do or the next generation a grandchild it's not unusual to have three generations of, of families working at the jack daniels distillery they don't want to mess it up because they want something to be there of value when their children come of age and are looking for work. So family is probably the best uh, QC you can have. And just a few weeks ago, you guys dedicated the oldest warehouse on the site in George Green's honor. Yes, we did. Uh, George Green, one of... um, one of nearest two sons that worked right after him at the distillery. Uh, a third son would come to work, and then grandkids and whatnot. Um, we just recently, that is a barrel house that was uh, built in the late 1930s, around 1938, after we came, uh, we got through Prohibition, Tennessee Prohibition, uh, National Prohibition, and in 38. Uh, we were back in operation. The first whiskey went into a barrel in November of 1938. So Len Motlow built those warehouses, um, and the name has officially been changed to the George Green um, Family Warehouse. 
I know that there's been a lot of connections between Jack Daniels and the Uncle Nearest folks over the last four or five years. But as you point out, there are other families that have equally long generational histories, including the current master distiller, Chris Fletcher, whose grandfather was a master distiller here. And and those families, indeed, are recognized. Uh, The Motlow family, we have the Motlow House, uh, which is on the distillery property. It was once the home of Lem Motlow and now is a place uh, where people gather. Fans of Jack Daniels will come to the Motlow House and visit. Our Tennessee Squires visit there and we'll do tastings there. You have the uh, uh, Miss Mary Bobos, and the Bobo family has been in this, uh, been working at the distillery for a number of years. One of the Bobo family members uh, prior to Chris. Uh, was a master distiller, Frank Bobo. So you have the Bobo home there. Uh, there are other places here in the county. Uh, Lem Tally, a previous master distiller, has a house in town that's a bed and breakfast. So, yes, various families are recognized in various ways if you just travel through the county. And Lem's, I believe, daughter, Lynn, is still associated with the distillery, or granddaughter. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Right. I believe she's a great... uh, Well, she's related to Jack Daniels through Lem. Uh, She's Jack's great-grandniece, or great-great-grandniece, Lynn Talley. And she operated Miss Mary Bobos, um, and she she, uh, was an official taster for Jack Daniels and um, was a spokesperson for many, many years. What brought you here? Well, um, I came down to Tennessee in 1976 and eventually got work at an agency where I was writing live read radio commercials for the Grand Ole Opry. That was one of the first things I I did some writing on. Uh, For those people who are in the South, they'll know the name Martha White. Uh, I did a lot of work uh, with Martha White and uh, Firestone. Uh, Firestone wrote worked on a history for Firestone. And in 1987, they were looking for, Jack Daniels was looking for a copywriter to help them introduce the first new whiskey in a century. And they hired our agency, and I ended up being the copywriter. And so I've worked uh, for Jack Daniels since 87, seen many, many new products introduced over the years. And because I, in essence, uh, inherited the files of the very first, um, uh, the very first advertising manager, marketing director of Jack Daniels, Art Hancock, who would retire later, I believe, in the late '80s, early '90s. Because of that, I I really had a, a bevy of information, and over time became the Jack Daniels historian. What's the most unusual thing that people should know about? Jack Daniel himself that has become really sort of lost to the average whiskey person, but that still is in the history books. Well, um, wow. It's hard to, you know, there's a lot of people that don't even know Jack um, was a real person. I mean, one of the things I've always found interesting is Jack is a nickname. His real name is Jasper Newton Daniel. And probably most people don't know, but at the time he was born, everybody would have known the names Jasper and Newton. Because Jasper and Newton were two Revolutionary War heroes. They freed some American citizens from the British, uh, these two sergeants did, and they became heroes. To the point, in there are counties throughout the country where you'll find a Jasper County next to a Newton County. And you'll find a a Jasper County with Newton as its county seat or a Newton County with Jasper as its county seat. You'll find that throughout the U.S. And it's to honor these two Revolutionary War heroes. And uh, I believe it's Jack's grandfather or great-grandfather. I believe it's his grandfather would have fought in the Revolutionary War. So for that's why he's named Jasper Newton Daniel. It was a popular name. I even have a family member in my uh, family tree with the name Jasper Newton. Uh, And and most people would know that, but they probably wouldn't even know that's his actual name. But there's so many things. You know, he owned a Patek Philippe watch in about 1912. No, it was earlier than that. 
because he'll pass away in 1911. I think it was probably 1902. It's inscribed on the watch. And the watch is now at the Patek Philippe Museum in Geneva, if you're ever there. But to think a Patek Philippe watch made its way all the way from Switzerland, and they have a record of when exactly it was made, all the way to Lynchburg, Tennessee, into the hands of Jack Daniels, I find amazing. But it also says something about his desire for quality. He really demanded quality. It was true of the accoutrements, like a pocket watch, and it was true of the whiskey he was making. How did he get nicknamed Jack then? We do not know. I'll tell you one thing. If you're around Lynchburg, Tennessee, you'll learn pretty quickly everybody has a nickname. So it's not surprising that he had a nickname. We're awfully glad that someone thought to name him, nickname him Jack because I don't think we'd sell as much Jasper Newton. Yeah, I was thinking myself, uh, Jasper Daniel, Jasper Daniel's whiskey just doesn't quite have the same ring to it. No, it doesn't. No, nope. I don't think that would uh, be nearly as popular. It doesn't roll off the tongue. By the way, Ben Green's book about the legacy of Jack Daniel's was republished in 2017 with a preface and foreword by Uncle Nearest founder Fawn Weaver and contributions by Green's sons as well. While you might find it online at outrageous prices through online booksellers, it is also available through the Lynchburg Hardware and General Store, the distillery's official gift shop in downtown Lynchburg. Full disclosure, I was in Lynchburg as a guest of Jack Daniels and Brown Foreman, but as always, full editorial control over the content of this episode remains with WhiskeyCast. That's Whiskey Cast in depth, brought to you by Oban. Every sip of Oban is like a postcard. Oban single malt Scotch whiskey is offering the chance to immerse yourself in Oban and the whiskey making process through the Oban Abode experience. Two winners will receive a trip to Scotland to stay in the Oban Abode, just steps from the distillery. To learn more and enter. Visit obenabode.obenwhiskey.com. Complete rules are available at the website. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. Let's start with New Liberty Distillery's Millstone Rye Whiskey, distilled in Philadelphia. It's a two year old whiskey made with malted rye and bottled at 47.5% ABV. The nose has subtle spices with hints of dill and other garden herbs, along with honey and vanilla. The taste has a nice balance of baking spices, garden herbs, rye bread, honey, and a hint of oak. The finish, long and dry with lingering spices. I'm scoring New Liberty's Millstone Rye a 90. Ruddles Mill Straight Bourbon is bottled by the Covered Bridges Whiskey Company, and gets its name from a historic covered bridge in Kentucky's Bourbon County. This one is bottled at 46.1% ABV. The nose has notes of dried flowers, straw, honey, vanilla, and a hint of spice that develops slowly. The taste starts off sweet, followed by a burst of black pepper with a subtle fruity tartness in the background, complemented by hints of dried flowers, brown sugar, and vanilla. The finish, long and dry, with subtle touches of spices and fruit. I'm scoring Ruddles Mill Straight Bourbon a 91. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first. This week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Friday the 13th is coming up, and while Friday the 13th may be thought of as unlucky... Rye Day the 13th will be a very lucky day for one whiskey lover. Sagamore Spirit is giving you the chance to go on the Sagamore Spirit Rye Treat. It's a VIP distillery experience that includes a trip to Sagamore Farm near Baltimore and a stay at the Sagamore Pendry Hotel on Baltimore's waterfront. Visit sagamorespirit.com slash rye day the 13th to enter. And please drink responsibly. We heard from Shibui Whiskey's Nicholas Palachi several weeks ago in episode 875. 
Shibui's 30-year-old Japanese single-grain whiskey was distilled from 100% long-grain indica rice at the Masahiro Distillery on Okinawa, and it's matured in a combination of ex-bourbon and sherry casks, along with virgin European oak. It's bottled at 43% ABV. The nose has touches of baked peaches, coconut cream pie, soft spices, toffee, pine sap, and cedar shavings. The taste has subtle spices and notes of brown sugar, linseed oil, licorice, and a touch of mint. The finish, long with lingering spices and hints of oak and pine sap. I'm scoring the Shibui 30-year-old single grain a 93. And finally, Brook Laddie celebrated the 20th anniversary of the distillery's revival this year during the virtual Fage Yield with the Laddie Origins Festival release. It's a complex combination of 13 different casks filled over 12 different years that really reflects the diversity of Brook Laddie's range over the past two decades. Laddie Origins is bottled at 56.3% ABV. The nose is malty and complex with touches of barley sugar, red apples, red grapes, cocoa, toffee, heather, and just a hint of spearmint in the background. The taste is complex and well-balanced with gentle spicy notes of black pepper, clove, and ginger root, along with touches of honey, brown sugar, blackberry jam, and oak that add complexity, along with a slightly astringent mouthfeel. The finish is long with a nice balance of oak and spices, along with touches of spearmint and brown sugar. I'm scoring Brook Laddie's Laddie Origins a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. I'll be adding these tasting notes to the searchable list of nearly 3,200 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. It's been 175 years and Durers continues to stay curious. We're proud to announce the newest addition to the innovative Durers 8-year cast finish series of Scotch whiskey, Durers Japanese Smooth. Brought to life by our award-winning master blender, Stephanie McLeod, Japanese Smooth is a perfectly balanced 8-year-old Scotch whiskey that puts a pioneering and innovative focus on our aging process. After eight years in Scotland, we blend, age again, then finish this whiskey in cast made from 200-year-old Mizunara oak trees. Rare? Sure, but worth it. The Mizunara oak perfectly complements the tasting notes with Dewar's Scotch whiskey. Japanese Smooth is loaded with Dewar's signature honey and floral notes, with the Japanese Mizunara oak adding exotic sweet and spicy flavors. Curious? Try this one in a perfect Japanese highball or on the rocks. It's time to announce our Whiskey Club of the Month for August. Congratulations to the Our Prague Whiskey Club in the Czech capital of Prague. Max Munson emailed us to nominate his club, which started back in late 2018 at the JAMA Steakhouse in Prague and switched to online tastings when the pandemic hit. Max writes, We have from 12 to 22 members sign up for each tasting, and cover whiskeys from around the world, focusing on Scotch, U.S. whiskey, and Irish whiskey. Although this online format is working, all of us can't wait to get back together in person, hopefully in the near future. Thanks for writing, Max, and congratulations! We'll be sending you two dozen whiskey cast Glencairn glasses to use at your club tastings when you are able to get back together in person once again. Now, if you're in a whiskey club and would like to nominate your group for future Club of the Month honors, it's easy. Just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Tell us a bit about your club, and if you have a website or other social media presence, we'll be glad to add a link on the Whiskey Clubs page at the WhiskeyCast website. We name a new Club of the Month on the first episode of each month. And we do carry over entries from month to month, so if you have already nominated your club, there's no need to do it again. 
Once again, congratulations to the Our Prague Whiskey Club in the Czech Republic, August's Whiskey Club of the Month. And thanks to Glencairn Crystal for helping us honor whiskey clubs around the world. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice. As you might expect, last week's interview with Heist director Nick Frew generated some heat on social media. Ed Hirsch at Bourbon Geek on Instagram is also one of the hosts of the Metal Rock and Whiskey podcast. He posted this comment, That was a very interesting episode, Mark. Like you, I wish they could have had more episodes to go into more detail about the heist. Thanks, Ed. Tim at Howlabit on Twitter was, shall we say, a bit more critical. Watching the doc right now. Everyone involved are complete morons. Absolutely everyone. Hashtag Pappygate. And BB at B squared underscore CL tweeted this. If Buffalo Trace had half a brain, Kurtzinger should be greeting tours and signing bottles in the gift shop. Well, there's a better chance of the Buffalo Trace gift shop selling Pappy Van Winkle t-shirts with the line, Drink it like you stole it, than that ever happening. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Let's close the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make the world of whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. And this week, we're going to answer once and for all a question that seems to generate a lot of debate at bars. Is Tennessee whiskey, specifically Jack Daniels, really a bourbon? Now, I thought we had cleared this up several times over the years. Apparently not, though. You see, the Montlow family persuaded the U.S. government to allow them to label Jack Daniels as Tennessee whiskey back in 1954, arguing that the use of charcoal mellowing made their whiskey different from bourbons of the day. But the Montlows were playing chess while the government was playing checkers, and the Motlows were focusing on one area of difference to distract regulators away from all of the similarities between Tennessee whiskey and bourbon. Let's put it this way. If Jack Daniels' master distiller Chris Fletcher doesn't have a problem with people lumping his whiskeys in with bourbons on bar menus, why should anyone else? What happens when you walk into a bar with your friends and you see Jack on the bourbon menu? Right. They, they all think that I'm going to, to have words with the, with the barkeep, but I'm not. Because Tennessee whiskey is bourbon at the end of the day. We qualify 100% as bourbon. It's the charcoal mellowing process that allows us, though, to claim Tennessee whiskey on our label. So it's basically just a product identity, a labeling, how we choose to identify and market our whiskey. And we have a long history of that. You know, number one, I'm pretty proud of what my granddad did here um, for over 30 years. And the Motlow family that taught them, of course, was Jack's family themselves. And upholding this tradition, that, that's how Jack himself was taught to make whiskey, the charcoal mellowing, 10 feet. Um, we do know that it impacts the aroma and the flavor of our whiskey. It does reduce the heavy corn notes that are very common in a lot of American whiskeys, a lot of bourbons. We're 80% corn in our grain bill, but when you open a bottle of Jack Daniels, you get that sweet kind of fruity aroma, you know, more caramel vanilla forward on the palate. You don't get a lot of that kind of cooked corn or sweet corn note, and that's what really the magic of charcoal mellowing does. So in short, charcoal mellowing does not prevent us from identifying as bourbon whiskey. We could if we chose but it allows us to identify as Tennessee whiskey. And so we think the history of that is important enough to hang on to it. In fact, when Tennessee state legislators passed a law defining what Tennessee whiskey is several years ago, they based it on the federal government's standards for bourbon, while requiring the so-called Lincoln County process of charcoal filtering, with one exception. Pritchard's Distillery was allowed to keep labeling its whiskeys as Tennessee whiskey, 
even though it has never used charcoal filtering. Founder Phil Pritchard said at the time that he did not want his whiskey to taste like Jack Daniels, and no one in the industry wanted to force him to change. If you have something you'd like us to look at on an upcoming episode, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a rare style of Irish whiskey with a creative twist, a unique triple distilled blend of single pot still and single malt premium Irish whiskies. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. Do you dare to be creative? That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the calendar of events, the whiskey photo of the week, and of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes, all the way back to 2005. Get in touch with us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. And now, a message from Robin Redbreast. Ever go out drinking with a peacock? <laughs> Always the same. Few too many, tail feathers come out, drinks get knocked over, bartender's not happy, night's over before it started. All I'm saying is, don't be the peacock in your group. Proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast, Redbreast. Pass it on. Just like the end of this Whiskey Cast episode, Dewar's Scotch Whiskey always makes for a smooth finish. Like our newly released Dewar's Japanese Smooth, aged for eight years in Scotland, blended then aged again before being finished for up to six months in Mizunar oak casts made from 200-year-old Japanese water oak trees. These unique casts layer distinct dry and spicy flavors to the whiskey, with aromas reminiscent of sandalwood and incense. Keep an eye out for a bottle of Dewar's Japanese Smooth at a store near you. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2021, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.